All right, well, um, just to make sure we can make the best use of everybody's time here, um, we can kick it off and get started. Uh, my name is Jenny Weigel. I am a project manager on the National Renewable Energy Laboratories team that's administering the Energizing Rural Communities Prize with you guys. Uh, this is funded out of the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, as I'm sure you're all well aware, um, but this is one part of our uh, longer term virtual training series with specific topics uh, that were chosen based on some of the submissions that you provided to us on the things that you'd be the most interested in learning. So we're hopeful that this is really targeted to uh, the kind of information that you guys are really looking for. Um, and we really value any feedback that you have. So please use this opportunity to ask specific questions. Tell us if there's any content that you know we haven't quite gotten to yet. Um, and we'll make sure that we can do what we can to, to really address some of the specific needs that you guys have. Um, so Ty, if you want to go to the next slide, um, I'll just go over a couple of housekeeping things for you guys before we kick off. Uh, this will be recorded and it'll be posted on that same site where you uh, registered on the American Made Challenges page. Um, please keep an eye on that page as that page will specifically include a lot of opportunities for um, additional training sessions, some of which are posted already, some of which are still to come. Um, and I've just put that link in the chat for your reference. Um, if you have any questions throughout the, uh, the presentation here, just make sure to put those in the chat um, and then we'll do a Q&A period at the end of the presentation. Um, I'll read off any questions that come into the chat for Rory and Ty, who are going to give you this presentation today. Um, and if you'd like to come off mute and just ask your question verbally, that's also an option as well. Um, and then if you have any issues, uh, my colleague Daniela Frank is also on the line here. Um, so please make sure to check all of your settings uh, if you're not able to hear anything or running into any issues. Um, but if you do have any other challenges, um, please reach out to Daniela and she can give you a hand. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to you, Ty, to kick us off. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Ty Hedlund. Uh, I'm a researcher here at NREL and we'll be covering uh, some ownership models and selection criteria for you all this morning. Um, so kind of a brief agenda, you know, how to choose an ownership model. We'll do an overview of ownership models with some examples, uh, touch briefly on ownership models and economic benefits. And then Rory is going to dive in some key regulatory considerations and policy contexts with some state and local policy considerations as well. Um, and then some kind of pointed implications for specific projects. And then as Jenny mentioned, uh, we will have some time for a Q&A at the end. <clears throat> so uh, I don't normally sound like this. Uh, I should lose my voice in about 20 to 25 minutes, which should coincide nicely with our timeline. Uh, so you know, how to choose an ownership model. Here are some elements for you to consider uh, as we work through this presentation this morning. Uh, the first is community characteristics. You know, what are your community's sustainability and clean energy objectives? Um, other, other aspects, you know, local engagement, community involvement. Will residents uh, participate in a community project? Budget and financial capacity. Uh, what kind of budget are you looking at? Um, is external financing, uh, grants, tax credits for the upfront costs, are there, is that available to you? The technical expertise, you know, is this in-house uh, for system operation and maintenance? If not, uh, are you going to be looking at, uh, you know, kind of a third party uh, ownership or partnership to handle the operations and maintenance? What's your community's level of comfort with some of the long-term financial and operational risks associated with these projects? And uh, can we build in some exit strategies that are beneficial for the community? What's your time scale look like? Uh, project development and implementation. Um, are your energy needs growing? Are they declining? Will we need to figure out if your system needs to scale with your community growth? You know, flexibility and control. We're going to touch a lot on this today. Uh, how much, you know, ownership do you want over the system, the design, its capabilities, um, and decision making? Funding availability. Um, don't want to get too bogged down in this today because we do we are dedicating some upcoming training specifically to this. But you know, as I mentioned, are there grants or tax incentives or financing options available uh, for specific ownership models? And then uh, the legal and regulatory landscape, which Rory is going to cover for you today. So 
renewable energy ownership models. The item I'd like for you to take away from this slide is that there are a multitude of renewable energy ownership models. So there's a good chance that one of them is going to fit your needs. Um, however, uh, I've got about a half hour with you today. Um, so interested in kind of the representative uh, as opposed to the comprehensive. So we will be looking more closely at a community shared partnership, a direct utility owned model, as well as a third party power purchase agreement. So let's jump into a community shared ownership overview. So what are the key elements uh, with this type of ownership model? Uh, community shared, the project is a distributed renewable energy system that provides power and or financial benefits to the community members. And by you know, distributed energy system, we're typically referring to uh, a geographically dispersed kind of a smaller generation system on the district on the greater distribution system and you know with the uh, declining costs of renewables these distributed energy resources they've evolved to include things you're probably familiar with like energy storage demand response as well as some energy efficiency measures uh, these types of ownership models you know they're collectively owned and managed by their users within the community <clears throat> and they range uh, from full ownership to uh, majority stake ownership or partial ownership. Community shared models, they're really suited towards uh, those who are unable to support a renewable energy system on their own. A, a variety of reasons could be behind this. Um, you know, maybe your neighbor's got uh, a bunch of trees covering your property that's affecting, you know, the solar irradiance, uh, just a number of reasons behind this. Uh, renters who, don't, who do not own their uh, own homes or buildings and are running into some principal agent problems. And, and also just those, you know, with a limited budget uh, for some of these larger high upfront cost capital investments associated with renewable energy projects. Cost sharing is a nice feature of community ownership. Um, these models, they enable individual participants to own parts of the asset uh, with lower levels of investment. Uh, and this is especially beneficial for the deployment of renewable energy assets, you know, where one individual might not be able to make it happen, a community might be able to. And uh, another hallmark of this ownership model is that, you know, the local decision making authority that comes along with it. And so you're able to uh, better align community needs and values with the renewable energy project. Uh, and also these ownership models, they, they're beginning to cover the entire energy value chain uh, from you know, localized power, heat and energy related services uh, to storage, uh, e electric vehicle charging, uh, energy efficiency measures, as well as providing flexibility uh, to the entire power system. So let's talk about some benefits. Um, you know, sometimes, but not always, kind of dependent on location, uh, we're going to get some local job creation, whether that's in the construction of the project or afterwards uh, with the ownership and maintenance of it. We're also going to be displacing uh, fossil fuel power generation with some clean, resilient power supply. The local distribution of profits associated with community shared ownership. Uh, we'll get into that on my very last slide. Um, but you know, the community empowerment aspect of this ownership model is important uh, because it really does go a long way to promote active community participation, uh, kind of fostering a sense of project ownership, talked about that local authority. Um, and it's also gonna raise some awareness within the community for other renewable energy projects. Uh, as I mentioned, as we are kind of generating clean, resilient power uh, within the community, it's going to lessen the demand on the grid, allowing that grid to you know, operate a bit more flexibly and resiliently. As mentioned, uh, you know, with the community aspect of this, um, it's increasing the deployment of renewables, <clears throat> getting these community projects online. And then uh, these ownership models, they also provide greater rates, rate stability um, and potential bill savings for participants. Uh, particularly in states uh, which allow net metering, which we'll talk about today, or you know, implement some other time of use or peak pricing type rate structures. 
So the flip side of this, of course, is the challenges. Um, talked about the cost sharing, good and bad. Um, bad if you don't get enough community participants uh, to join into the renewable energy project. Um, the project development and management processes, you know, the operations and maintenance, these are absolutely critical uh, to ensure that the renewable energy system, uh, you know, lasts its, its useful life for one, um, and as well operates efficiently kind of on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute basis. Um, so if communities are lacking the kind of technical capabilities behind this, hiring a third party for these O&M type processes, it's an added cost. Um, these renewable energy projects, there's high upfront capital costs and also long-term ownership. Um, and this, you know, it's gonna involve ongoing maintenance, ongoing investments and responsibilities uh, that maybe not all community members have an appetite for, you know, 12, 15 years down the road. So with the implementation, um, a couple of things to consider here. We've got net metering. So this is a mechanism uh, that's going to credit these distributed generation owners for the power that their systems contribute to the grid. And the eligibility for this is really dependent on kind of utility and state level requirements. Another aspect is virtual net metering, which is going to allow customers uh, to receive bill credits for the generation that they then sell back to the grid. And some form of virtual net metering um, is, is really essential for these community type solar ownership projects to work properly so that multiple customers can offset uh, their electricity loads from the system. And then last kind of consideration, implementation consideration are the tax credits associated with the project, uh, which may apply differently uh, to community solar participants, depending on the structure of the program. Um, again, uh, upcoming trainings are going to cover that in more detail, just something to keep in the back of your mind right now. So I wanted to kind of show you an example of kind of this community shared ownership model uh, in practice. Uh, a little bit older example, but it's, it's a good one. Um, so this University Park Community Solar is a 22 kilowatt rooftop solar PV system. Uh, it's, it's a member managed LLC. They limited the members to 35 and, you know, they took the time to structure it in a way so that the LLC was able to gain an exemption from some state uh, and federal filing requirements. <clears throat> and it was also structured uh, into a 20 year agreement between the site host, uh, which is a church in University Park uh, and the LLC. And that agreement, of course, is going to detail uh, the provision of electricity, access to the solar array, the maintenance, the operations of it, uh, as well as the insurance aspect. And there's also an option uh, to purchase the system uh, prior to the end of the agreement. So this system uh, had a total installed cost of around $130,000 and the capital stack behind it uh, came from, you know, those 35 members, investments from them. Uh, they took advantage of $39,000 um, in the form of it. They opted to take it as a grant as opposed in lieu of a tax credit uh, and a $10,000 grant from the state of Maryland. Um, when we look at the benefits for the community or for this member managed LLC, there's revenue distribution in a number of different ways. The first, of course, is electricity sold both to the church as well as to the grid. There's a renewable energy credit auction and also uh, the tax incentives um, as well as depreciation. So if we think back real quick to those implementation issues I just discussed, I think the most critical aspects uh, of this community shared partnership was they took, it was about a year or two long process uh, working with the state of Maryland to change the state's net metering law. So uh, absolutely critical to kind of have the structure in place so that once your system gets online, it's going to work appropriately. All right, let's look at third-party ownership. Uh, similar structure here, the key elements here, um, we've got an organization 
community business going to sign a long-term contract with a third-party seller, uh, electricity seller who's, who agrees to build, maintain, and operate a renewable energy system either on the customer's site or off-site. And regardless of uh, where the renewable energy system is placed, uh, the customer is going to receive the delivery of that electricity through the main grid. And the system owner, you know, they're providing the investment capital. Uh, we'll talk about the benefits uh, on the next slide, but the system owner, they're providing the investment capital up front in return for tax benefits, which they can then pass along to nonprofits uh, in the form of electricity cost savings. So these third-party ownership models, they're really suited towards customers located in competitive electricity markets. Uh, they're going to be particularly beneficial for governments, schools, nonprofits, uh, customers, and then lastly, customers without that operations and maintenance capacity uh, to handle these systems on their own. As I mentioned, uh, customers interested in potential cost savings with no upfront capital costs, third-party ownership might be a good option to, to look at. All right, the benefits. Again, uh, with third-party ownership, that investor is coming in and providing the upfront capital for the project. Um, this makes it an attractive option for communities, uh, maybe with budget constraints, or kind of a limited appetite for some of these larger scale upfront investments. Um, also with third-party developers, you're often going to find some benefits that you'll be able to benefit from their economies of scale because they likely have multiple projects happening at once. Um, they can benefit from some purchasing power. And also they've, they've just got the technical experience and expertise behind these projects. They can often get these projects online for you quicker uh, than if, you know, a community was to take this on themselves. For tax-exempt entities, uh, governments, schools, nonprofits, these third-party owners uh, can provide the ability to benefit indirectly from tax incentives through those lower electricity uh, prices that I previously mentioned. Um, and within these third-party agreements, um, mostly power of purchase agreements, uh, they're going to offer more predictable kind of predetermined electricity prices, um, which allows going to allow communities uh, to kind of plan uh, for their future energy costs more effectively. Within the agreement, there is going to be kind of a, an annual escalation in electricity prices. All of that can be negotiated, you know, before the system gets online. One of the one of the largest benefits for this third party ownership model is again the third party that system owner they're handling all the operations and maintenance um, for you so it's not going to be a headache for you and depending on how you negotiate this uh, third party agreement there can be a potential path to ownership for the community um, you know at the end of the uh, agreement term so challenges. <clears throat> Currently, um, I think Rory will dive into this, but only about 29 states uh, and, and Washington, D.C. allow these PPAs, uh, so not everyone can benefit from this type of model. The, this power purchase agreement, the negotiation process, uh, it can be lengthy uh, and complex, so think costly. Um, and there are potentially complex regulations behind PPAs in some states, these power purchase agreements uh, they may be subject to uh, the system owner may be subject to regulation as a utility. Uh, again, I think increased costs. Uh, and with a third party owner, or the community itself is kind of ceding some control over, you know, the design and structure of the project. Not all, but some. Um, again, depending on how the agreement is structured, you may or may not. Uh, have the ability to purchase the system prior to the end of the agreement. And, you know, the PPA pricing, it could be suboptimal. Um, it could be the case that the community might be better off um, just owning the system outright from the beginning and, and, and dealing with the operations and maintenance uh, yourself. 
Um, similar to the community shared, these you know these power purchase agreements, they're going to be long-term contracts, uh, which may commit the communities to fixed energy prices for extended periods, um, which you know it may it may limit the community's flexibility uh, to quickly and effectively respond to changing market conditions. So many things to consider. Again, we kind of wanted to show you an example of this in action. Um, I think this is this is a good third party power purchase agreement example um, because it's really going to show you that throughout this negotiation process, um, you can kind of structure a third party PPA however you can come to an agreement. Um, so this particular example is Colorado Mountain College Solar and Storage Complex. Um, it is under a power purchase agreement with Holy Cross Energy. Amoresco, the system owner, they installed a five megawatt solar PV and 15 megawatt hour battery energy storage system. Uh, you can see it's a large project in the picture there. It's spread across 22 acres of land owned by Colorado Mountain College and leased by Amoresco. So we've got a lot of different flows happening here. Um, and that's how they structured it. And we're going to see the benefits that everybody's really benefiting from this type of structure. So when we look at the benefits here, this Colorado Mountain College, they're receiving renewable energy credits that are going to offset electrical usage across three of their campuses. And they're also receiving uh, the land lease revenue from Amoresco. Holy Cross Energy, uh, they're a cooperative with about 50,000 members. And those members are going to be benefiting from energy cost savings uh, resulting from this project. And then, of course, the battery storage <clears throat> is going to allow uh, the system to discharge um, energy to customers during periods of peak demand. Again, and this is going to increase flexibility of the grid. It's going to save the, the customer's money. Um, so, again, a lot of different flows here. But I think the takeaway is that, you know, really be, um, you know, go into these third party PPA negotiations uh, and ask for what you want, uh, because it likely can be negotiated. All right. The last example we're going to look at today uh, is a direct utility owned overview. I think uh, it's probably an ownership model most of us are very familiar with. Uh, these electric utilities responsible for the delivery of electricity to homes and businesses. This is going to include uh, metering, billing, customer service, uh, and investor-owned utilities, which is what we'll be looking at. Um, I chose that because it's the most, it's kind of the most prevalent uh, utility model in the, in the United States, serving nearly 75% of the country. So um, these investor-owned utilities, there are for-profit corporations. Uh, they're owned by shareholders, and as such, they have a fiduciary responsibility uh, to provide a rate of return to those shareholders. These utilities, uh, they're often designated a service territory by regulators, and as the startup costs of these are, you know, substantial, uh, they are, the costs are substantial. Uh, because they're establishing generation plants, they're establishing transmission and distribution infrastructure. And so the structure of these is really traditionally they're state regulated uh, natural monopolies. I think this is shifting a bit, uh, as we will see with regulatory and market reform and utilities are also, you know, diving into some business model reform on their own. Again, highly regulated at the state level. Um, in most areas, of the US, these uh, investor-owned utilities, they can interconnect and trade with one another to take advantage of cost and reliability benefits. And you know, the market reform, this started in the late 90s. Um, it's enabled more competition in the market, customer choice, uh, depending on where you are. Some of you may be familiar with customer choice, as well as the integration of flexible kind of renewable energy generation resources. So the benefits of, of these utilities, um, 
obvious, obviously they've been around for a long time. They have a lot of experience working with you know, energy projects in both developing, managing both small and large scale projects. With that experience, of course, is going to come this technical expertise, maintenance capacity, and the financial management capacities necessary to make the project successful. Utilities uh, often have access to uh, capital from operations to finance projects, as well as investor provided capital in the forms of debt and stock. Um, they often have in-house legal counsels. Uh, they're better suited to managing complex regulations associated with uh, utilities at the state level. They've got interconnection capabilities, which can make connecting, you know, mini grids to the main grids a lot smoother process. <clears throat> and utilities uh, are often able to provide subsidies uh, to mini grid consumers through tariffs collected from grid connected customers. Again, I think some of the challenges here, again, they're designated a service area. Um, very difficult to start a utility on your own. So uh, the, monop the monopolistic uh, structure is definitely a challenge. Um, these investor-owned utilities, again, they're going to be balancing both shareholder interests uh, with that fiduciary responsibility to provide a rate of return with consumer interests who may be more interested in renewable energy projects. Uh, utilities, it can be an inefficient business model. Uh, they just have a strong preference for capital investments, which can put them at odds with smart grids or privately owned distributed energy systems. Uh, the projects, uh, utility scale projects can be politically vulnerable um, as the rate cases, they need to be approved by elected officials on a, a, a state level utility commission. <clears throat> and you know, if Utilities, if they're not going to be able to take advantage of economies of scale, um, you know, it, it can lead to higher costs for rural customers. They want to get connected to the grid. Again, publicly traded investor owned structure, it can lead to a disconnect between, you know, what the shareholders are asking for and the, you know, the what the local community is asking for from a renewable energy project. Um, and again, utilities have the experience and ability to manage these complex, complex regulations, but it's going to come at a cost. All right. <clears throat> this, I think, will be a beneficial uh, example for some of you if you're looking at microgrid projects. This is the Beck Hill Rural Microgrid Project in Montana. It is a grid connected project, which uses an array of 132 ground mounted. Uh, PV panels and 24 batteries, and it's it's you know it's a pilot project. It's designed to kind of test the potential of using these small microgrids to improve the reliability of electric services to customers in rural areas. The project itself is is sited on a quarter acre of private land. If we remember the uh, the third party example was sited on 22 acres. This is sited on a quarter acre. Um, and it's this particular project is providing uh, support to 17 rural customers. Um, and I guess just just for your awareness, Northwestern Energy, if you're not familiar, this it's a publicly traded investor owned utility serving 700,000 customers across uh, Montana, South Dakota and Nebraska. This Beck Hill microgrid project, it has a, a 40 kilowatt solar PV system with a battery capacity uh, that can provide up to two hours of max power to those 17 rural customers in the event of an outage. Uh, the batteries, they can push storage to the grid uh, when they're full. And also during an outage, this system, it'll automatically island, provide electricity to those customers. And then once power is restored, it will automatically connect back to the grid, charge those batteries and push electricity to the grid. So I think some takeaways here, um, it's a grid connected project, may or may not be a possibility for rural or tribal customers, uh, but the concept itself, the system's ability to island 
it's kind of a proof of concept for those looking to provide continuous power to critical infrastructure, uh, like health centers or schools, food processing and storage facilities, water sewer facilities, and maintaining power uh, for some of the more vulnerable members of communities during extreme weather events. All right, so this, this is my last slide, and then I'll turn it over to Rory. Um, this is an idea I've been trying to wrap my head around, simply a visual for you, but I think it's important to understand that the economic benefits for your community are going to be very dependent on which type of ownership model you choose. When we look at direct benefits, just uh, think of kind of the first round of spending um, for you know renewable energy project salaries, for the supplies to build those projects, and some operating expenses. As we move out, those indirect benefits are going to be more business to business transactions. Um, the businesses initially benefiting from the direct benefits, they are likely going to increase their spending at other local businesses, local or regional businesses, and keep that money flowing in the local or regional economy. And then as we move even further out to the next rung, the induced benefits are think kind of household to business activity. Um, when the businesses are experiencing increased revenue from the direct and indirect benefits, may be more likely to hire more employees um, and raise salaries, which is going to impact your local communities. So what I wanted to get across here was that if we can kind of think of this bullseye on a map and we look at the community shared solar project in Maryland, you know, if we put this over the community in Maryland, it's going to it's going to maintain a pretty tight circle for these three levels of benefits because it's community shared. Everything is going to be flowing circular in that local, maybe regional economy. As we consider the third party PPA model and the utility owned model where we've got, you know, publicly traded utilities with shareholders widely dispersed, if we were to put you know, this bullseye on a map over that Beck Hill microgrid project, those direct benefits are definitely going to be impacting those 17 rural customers in Montana. But the indirect benefits and induced benefits are definitely going to start flowing out and dispersed much more broadly within uh, a regional or national economy. So kind of a thought experiment. Uh, just wanted to kind of give you a visual uh, of how your ownership model choice is going to impact your local, regional, and or national communities. So with that, I will turn it over to Rory. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Di. Um, there is uh, a little bit of overlap. I'm hoping to get into more of the detail of where the different, a lot of the different policies that Ty referenced um, that are important to your, potentially to your project. Uh, where those exist or don't exist, uh, so you have a better sense of, um, you know, based on where your project, where your community is, and where your project is being developed, uh, what are the different key considerations that you should uh, look into and take into account? Because the the market regulatory and policy frameworks that govern your region, state, or even local community are important to be aware of and take into consideration as you decide which ownership model to pursue and assess, and also to when you assess the feasibility and benefits as Ty referred to of your preferred model. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. I'm gonna to try to provide a high level overview of a number of different uh, frameworks, I guess, that you need to, that you need to pay attention to. Uh, that may be relevant to your project. So to begin, in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a push to infuse competition into the electricity and gas sectors. One of the outcomes was the creation of seven regional transmission organizations, or RTOs, in the United States, as well as two across the border in Canada. Uh, and that's important for any, any projects that are located in states that border uh, our neighbors to the north. And while there's a small difference we don't need to get into today, RTIs, RTOs might also be structured as an independent system operator or ISO. They're very similar, but the rules are a little bit different. Uh, in general, RTOs operate the transmission system in their respective regions and administer the associated wholesale energy and capacity markets where generating resources may compete against each other to sell their electricity into the market and make money. 
uh, there's a lot of detail that might be relevant to your project, but for uh, today's purpose is relevant because if your project will be cited within an RTO, that might provide you with the opportunity to sell electricity generated from your project into your respective wholesale market or RTO. Traditionally, only larger projects on the scale of 10 megawatts or more were eligible to bid into the market, but a new order that came out this year uh, where the rules are still being finalized from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC Order 2222, enables distribute, smaller distributed energy resources to compete as well. And while many other factors would be involved in determining whether this is an opportunity that might benefit your project and community, it's certainly something to consider. It's also important to note, though, that participating in a wholesale market does require a much higher level of sophistication and operational capacity, and that might also influence your decision about which either which ownership model to pursue or whether this matters to you at all. So conversely, if you live in a state that does not participate in wholesale energy markets, this opportunity is not currently available. Um, next slide, please. That same push for market competition went even further in many states to also include competition at the retail or consumer level. Uh, in most states, there's still one electric utility uh, for each service area that holds a statutory monopoly over the sale of electricity within that respective service area. So if you live in Charlotte, North Carolina, for example, Duke Energy is your only option for buying electricity and nobody else is allowed to compete with Duke to sell you power. Similarly, if you're in a community in a regulated monopoly state, your community could not develop and own a project and sell it, that electricity to residents and businesses in your community or even to the local utility without special regulation, regulations or agreements with your utility, such as a PPA, um, as Ty was talking about. By comparison, states that have authorized retail electricity competition may offer more opportunities for your project depending on the rules that govern those markets. In other words, you might have more options for ownership models in a state with retail electricity competition than you would in my home state of North Carolina, for instance. Retail competition, also known as choice, as, as noted on this map, takes many forms and doesn't necessarily mean that any company can come in and compete to sell your electricity directly. Uh, that does exist in its purest form in states such as Texas, where per, almost the whole state does have full re retail competition. Many other states also allow retail competition, but limit it in one form or another. And you can kind of see some variation uh, in the map on the screen right there. Whether or not your state allows retail competition is relevant to selecting an ownership model because it offers a market to sell electricity from your project and generate revenue. But it, on the other hand, it likely limits your ownership, ownership choice to private ownership models and requires uh, most likely, depending on this, the rules of the state, registering and operating as a utility. And I do think that's a, a requirement in all, in all the retail choice states. Next slide. So I, I was a little afraid of this. Um, a slide that I had created earlier did not make it into the final slide deck yet, so I do apologize. But I'm going to cover briefly community choice aggregation. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, I will put a link uh, to a map of states that allow community choice aggregation. Um, so other forms that retail competition might take include the option for community choice aggregation where a state has authorized local governments to purchase all or a portion of their power on behalf of their community, their constituents, from an alternative electricity supplier that is not their traditional electricity supplier, while still receiving transmission and distribution service from their existing utility provider. Community choice aggregation opens up options and opportunities for your community if you are in a community choice aggregation state to partner with an alternative electricity supplier to achieve your clean energy goals. Uh, so for instance, if there is a, an alternative supplier that says we can cover half of your electricity with this solar project that we're building, um, then you'll be able to go greener faster, uh, go cleaner faster than what your incumbent or your existing utility might, might be uh, working on or achieving. And it could also potentially be that supplier could be a community owned project, however defined or however structured uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a third party independent um, developer that is not necessarily rooted in the community. So, and Ty, if you don't mind, go ahead and jump into the next slide and then we're going to 
come back. This just seemed to make more sense now. Another form, uh, and Ty talked heavily about this, so really I just want you to see the map for the most part. Uh, but as he mentioned, third party sales and leasing, uh, and when I say sales, that's that power purchase agreement is something that a lot that exists to varying degrees in a lot of states. So just because your state has it, you do want to understand the rules and limitations that were implemented in your state around third party sales and leasing. Um, but in general, as he as he referred to, the customer can benefit from a lower electricity cost via the PPA or through lower power bills, via net metering or a similar tariff. And this this has a lot of interplay with the net metering policy that may or may not be available to you and whether you can have aggregate or virtual net metering. So a lot of these policies and frameworks interact um, in a lot of ways, depending on your how you're structuring your ownership model and, and everything else that goes along with your project. So um, since he went so deep into it, I'll just, we can go ahead and jump back to net metering, which he also did go deep into, but I have some other things to add to. So thanks, yep. So for projects that rely on net metering or, or net billing, and I should, I should back up, net metering is, tip, tip, is one of various ways that your electric utility might compensate you for a clean energy project you either have on your roof, whether it's a residential roof or on a commercial or municipal building. Um, net metering generally refers to where they are giving you retail rate credit. So you are saving on a one-to-one -one basis or even more if they have a, if they have a value of solar uh, premium that they might be offering you. Um, but at a minimum, you're typically under net metering. You are uh, monetizing the value of your generation of your clean energy project at a one, on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, so you're saving for every kilowatt hour you're saving, you're saving whatever you would have paid for that kilowatt hour. There's also net billing. Uh, which is kind of an in-between approach. You are selling all of your electricity to the utility, not necessarily at retail rate, but also not at their avoided cost. Um, and then there's what's known as a, a buy-all, sell-all. Um, and that's where you are basically having a direct PPA in a sense through your tariff with your utility, and they are only paying you at their avoided cost, which is the bare minimum required under federal law. So. Um, so just to understand before I go further, there's different types of uh, distributed comp generation compensation that your utility offers for smaller projects. Um, so where was I? And in the interest of time, I think I'm doing okay. So I'll just, I'll try to round this out in the next four minutes. Uh, there's different aspects. So not only the value, the value is important, but also you need to know does your state state or, or public service, public utilities commission net metering policy apply to your utility? In a lot of states, it only applies to privately owned investor owned utilities and will not apply, such as in my state, to rural electric cooperatives or municipal utilities. Um, so you need to understand, that is your, your utility beholden to whatever state policy has been set in place? Do they offer aggregate net metering or virtual net metering? What does that mean for your project? Um, there's other pieces to this, and we can answer any questions during a, an open office hour or future events, but uh, does your utility allow you to retain ownership of any renewable energy credits? And how can you, is there a renewable energy credit market in the state that you can leverage to it to generate additional revenue for your project? Or is your utility, for whatever reason, saying that they own your renewable energy credits, and so that value is not available to you? <clears throat> Excuse me. So. Some overall, some states and utilities have supportive policies and some do not. So you really want to understand how those policies impact the long-term benefits of your project. And I see that there was a request to go back to a slide, but maybe we'll do that during Q and A if that's okay. So I can get through my last few slides. Next slide, Ty. Oh yeah, sorry, you can pass this one. Thank you. And then there's other state and local policies that uh, that you need to look into and be aware of as well. One is your state interconnection standards for distributed generation. These regulate how the interconnection of small to medium scale distributed generation resources. Those standards might include system size requirements, technology and technical standards, and required grid co components that, that have to do with 
uh, a lot of things, but one being the hosting capacity of your particular feeder, uh, your particular part of the grid that you want to interconnect to. They might set tiered levels of application and fee requirements when you want to interconnect the system. Uh, for instance, Wisconsin has, based on the size of your project, your application requirements and your fee starts going up the larger your system gets. So understanding what those, those standards and requirements and fees are. Uh, they might also set different liability insurance requirements. Uh, and a lot of this does interact with implementation of the federal law, which sets minimum interconnection requirements and says, you can interconnect, but your states and your utilities can impose uh, the standards under which you are allowed to interconnect your system. Um, a lot of those are also technology based. They include all the technology uh, requirements to ensure reliability that, uh, that you need to meet, depending again on your system size or what concerns you, your utility might have. And in a lot of states, I mentioned how some states only regulate investor and utilities. Uh, your utility might not have to abide by the state's interconnection policy for the larger investor and utilities. Your utility might have its own interconnection policy uh, because they don't have to, they don't have to follow what the state tells them to do. So uh, local zoning laws, we're seeing this pop up everywhere now. Uh, local counties are setting zoning restrictions or putting um, moratoria on new large, on new, you know, commercial scale solar projects of various sizes. Uh, so understanding what's happening in your in your local utility or lo sorry local community, <clears throat> and what your state might be considering around zoning for uh, clean energy projects is going to be important. And I mentioned multiple times which utility or project types do all of these policies apply to, and uh, how does that affect your your project feasibility, your ownership model, all of those things. So, and I think with that, uh, one more slide. Please, Ty, thanks. So overall, the regulatory and policy framework can impact your decision on the ownership model because it impacts, impacts your relative economic benefits. Uh, so you wanna think, does this make sense? Is it feasible and it, does it align with our community goals for our projects? They affect where a project can be built. They affect the project cost and the cost effectiveness of different ownership approaches. They affect your decision around the scale of the projects, um, as well as what, what technology you're, you're selecting. So I uh, hope that was useful and we can turn it back to Ty or Jenny for Q&A. Thanks, Rory. Um, I'm just gonna go through the couple of questions so far that have been submitted in the chat. Um, and if you have any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or just raise your hand and we'll, um, you're able to, to unmute yourself. So the first one that we received here was from Deborah in specific reference to the community shared ownership model. Um, do you ever see electric co-ops being a partner along with their community or is the co-op the venue because it is technically already community owned? Yeah, that's a good question. I think you'd get into, I mean, if we looked back at the at the benefits and challenges, I think that's where that would come into play because then your your benefits are going to kind of be limited to the members of that co-op, as opposed to if you just got a group of community members together and threw together a renewable energy project. Uh, so I think it would kind of depend on uh, that flow of benefits. Um, but again, uh, I think the, you know, that, that kind of list of ownership models we covered at the beginning, that was also not comprehensive. There were kind of subsections within each of those. Um, so there are multiple options on how to structure each one of those. Um, again, I think it's just going to be on uh, a decision uh, on how you want to see those, those benefits flow. Jenny, can I chime in here? Yeah, of course, please do. Okay, great. Um, I, I, we are working with a tribe and the tribe is a member of the co-op. So, I, you know, I think we'll, we'll just, we'll start talking to the co-op to see if, um, but I think it's a, a greater member of like Bonneville Power Administration, I think has- Interesting. A yeah, so. Is, is the, so is the, is the tribe then, is that reservation based and is that reservation tied into the grid? It is, yeah. Interesting, wow. It's that, also yeah. um, on the, 
that's my understanding. It's also on the Nevada Idaho border. So it's crosses two states, which makes it, things a little more complicated. Cool. That, yeah, I'd like to talk more about that. Um, okay. I'll find if you'd like to uh, find some time. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Deborah, and thanks, Ty. Um, we've got a question from Peter regarding some of the specific restrictions on net metering and uh, utility monopolies in a specific area. So, um, Peter, you wrote in here that you're um, forced to look at combinations of two or more renewable energy technologies. And um, the question out to Rory and Ty is, is there a specific kind of ownership model that might apply for these kinds of hybrid systems and any suggestions that you have in that structure? And Peter, if you have anything that you want to add to that. Lay it on me, guys. Yeah, so I'll start. I did see your your question earlier. And I, is there, so for hybrid systems that typically those sound like they would be more a commercial scale system. Is that how you're thinking about it? Larger than a residence, smaller than a big box store. Yes, yes, so small commercial system. Uh, I actually, I almost feel a little stumped. I've never seen a net metering policy apply to a hybrid system that, that's not solar plus storage, right? That's your typical configuration, um, which by the way, I, I wanna add one more thing. Your net metering tariff could also impact whether adding storage to your solar system makes sense or not. So I just wanna add that as a caveat. I can talk more about that another time or during office hour, but um, if, I, if I understand your question, so it's a small commercial system and you are wondering how or what type of net metering policy would apply or, or how they would affect hybrid systems, I apologize. Uh, we're in Indiana. They made net metering so small that it's, killed solar it's like uh three cents coming back so pretty much everyone has stopped so we know that solar alone will not fly so our right. next choice is geothermal and then we're looking at solar hot water and then hot water heaters and maybe a biomass stove so i'm not asking you to solve the problem for us but uh how can we come up with an ownership model where we've got more than one technology mixed together mm -hmm. I think this requires a longer <clears throat> conversation. Ty, do you have any, and I, there's a reason I say that, but Ty, do you have any, any responses? Yeah, I mean, definitely not anything that's gonna solve the problem right now. Um, yeah. I think if we put our three heads together, our two heads together with, with uh, Peter, uh, it'd definitely be a good conversation. Should I reach you through the Rural Energy Prize at nrl.gov and yeah. ask for office hour? If you reach out through there, it'll get filtered to Rory and I, and then we can connect directly. Thank you so much. Of course. Yeah, great. And Deborah, I think that uh, that message and the contact information applies to your question as well. So please do reach out to that, that inbox. Yes, yes. Uh, and then the last question that I saw came in here was also from Peter as well, um, in reference to, um, this may be something that we cover in one of the upcoming trainings. Um, so Rory and Ty, you can stop me if that's the case. Um, but ultimately it's a question regarding uh, getting financing for some of these projects and the process for presenting a renewable energy project to these bankers to, to really encourage them to, um, to actually go forward. Yeah. Yeah, Peter, I, I saw your question in there about uh, the collateral requirements from rural community bankers. Um, I come from a community banking background, so uh, totally understand what you're saying. And that your question, it applies to some of the broader equity justice research uh, we're doing at NREL. Um, so I think there's in an interesting conversation to be had there as well. Um, and there's also parallels to some other projects that I'm working on directly. Um, but um, in three minutes, uh, we are going to dedicate, I believe, two entire upcoming trainings to kind of project development, siting, um, operations, maintenance, and financing options, which is uh, going to be a real long, deep dive into the different financing options. So I, I, not to leave you with a cliffhanger, 
um, <laughs> or, or to get you coming back uh, for your answer in a couple of weeks. Uh, but that might be the best option. Unless Rory, uh, you want to touch on any financing options? No, I think this this requires a conversation rather than a quick answer for sure. One I mean, thing we found uh, talking to bankers is that they've said no quite a few times. Uh, they did say if you're doing some uh, some kind of physical uh, improvement or addition that you're financing that, that we can put the renewable energy on top of that. So especially if that thing that you add on or expand can be separated so they can call it collateral, that's what seems to tip the scale for them. But that's right. hard to figure out how to thread that needle. Right. Um, yes, one of the ways, I guess briefly, one of the ways in another project we're looking at is um, essentially like uh, a buy down from kind of a green bank or outside funders uh, to make, to kind of uh, spread the risk for these community banks. Uh, but I think what I'm interested in as far as research here is really figuring out, I mean, it's got to be a communication with these banks. It's got to be a new type of financing and a new understanding um, and getting them familiar with it. Um, so it's, it's something I'm very interested in and uh, we're happy to, happy to talk to you about it in more detail. Send you an email. Thanks, guys. Great, thanks all. Those were all of the uh, the questions that I saw in the chat here. Um, so if there's anything else that um, anyone would like to ask in the last minute, please feel free to drop it in here. Otherwise, just reach out to us on that email address that um, that Ty did put in the chat. Um, Roy or Ty, any closing thoughts that you want to share? No, other than that, you know, there's going to be multiple opportunities to to think through a lot of these and other considerations uh, throughout the rest of the, the support opportunities that we're setting up for you and we'd love to continue this conversation and, and help make your project a reality. So thanks for being here today. Yeah. Yeah. Check out, check out the calendar of upcoming events. Uh, please join us for those. Um, this was, this, this covered a lot of material at a high level in about 40 or 45 minutes today. So uh, do please reach out to that email. Uh, we'd be happy to connect uh, more on a one-to-one -one basis.